service of ordination. Let me read from the psalmist. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Well, we begin our service by singing the first hymn on the sheet. O God of our fathers, creator and Lord, majestic in glory, by heaven adored.
Well, as we sit, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we rejoice as we bow before you in the name of your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom the fullness of your glory is revealed and declared to all nations, proclaiming the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And through his gospel, we have been gathered into your family to be counted as your children, adopted, brought in through faith into the family you call your Israel, your people forever, those upon whom you've set your love and called to share in the grace that flows to us in this glorious gospel. And so, Lord, as we come tonight naming the name of the Lord Jesus, to praise you, to hear your word, and also to set aside, Josh, for the ministry of this word, this gospel of grace, we pray that you would thrill our hearts again with the wonder of your great goodness to us, of the joy and the gladness which it brings to our hearts. Turn our eyes and the eyes of our hearts, we pray, in all that is said and all that is done tonight to you, our great Savior, so that we might bring glory to your name, both here tonight in all that's done, and as we leave here, encouraged, built up, refreshed in your great goodness to us. So hear us. And draw near to us, we pray, for we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Well, a very warm welcome to uh, visitors with us this evening from our uh, various partner churches and to those who are here uh, as friends and family uh, of Josh Johnson. We're particularly glad uh, to have you with us, and uh, we trust that this will be a memorable evening for us all. There will be afterwards tea and coffee served downstairs. Uh, if you'd like to stay behind, we'd love you to do that. Just go out the back and turn right and uh, you'll find your way down the stairs there. And uh, we'll be glad to uh, facilitate the time of fellowship and sharing that we hope uh, we can have after the formal part of the evening. But uh, we're going to sing again now the second hymn on the sheets. I think it should come on the screens as well. A hymn that reminds us that we're here because we have a gospel to proclaim, which is good news all throughout this earth.
Well, we're going to read from the scriptures now, from Mark's Gospel, chapter 9. You'll find the uh, passage uh, in the orders of service here, uh, if you don't have a Bible. And uh, it's from Mark, chapter 9, verse 30 to 50. I'll read, first of all, uh, in English, and then Hamid is going to read uh, in Farsi for our uh, Farsi-speaking brothers and sisters. And it's a joy to have uh, Rupert Hunt Taylor back this evening to preach to us. And uh, welcome, Rupert. And this is the passage he's chosen. So let's look at Mark chapter 9 at verse 30. Jesus and his disciples went on from there and passed through Galilee. And he did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days, he will rise. But they did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask him. And they came to Capernaum. And when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve. And he said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them. And taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him. For no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of cold water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Amen. آنها آن مکان را ترک کردند و از میان جلیل گذشتند. ایسا نمیخواست کسی بداند او کجاست. زیرا شاگردان خود را تعلیم میداد و در این باره به ایشان سخن میگفت که پسر انسان به دست مردم تسلیم خواهد شد و او را خواهند کشت. اما سه روز پس از کشته شدن برخواهد خواست. ولی منظور او را در نیافتن و میترسیدن از او سوال کنند. بزرگی در چیست؟ سپس به کفر ناهوم آمدند. هنگامی که در خانه بودند، عیسی از شاگردان پرسید: بین راه درباره چه چیز بحث می کردید؟ ایشان خاموش ماندند. زیرا در راه در این باره بحث می کردند که کدام یک از آنها بزرگتر است. عیسی بنشست و آن دوازده تن را فرا خواند و گفت: هر که می خواهد نخستین باشد، باید آخرین و خادم همه باشد. سپس کودکی را برگرفته در میان ایشان قرار داد و در آغوشش کشیده به آنها گفت هر که چنین کودکی را به نام من بپذیرد مرا پذیرفته است و هر که مرا بپذیرد نه مرا بلکه فرستنده مرا پذیرفته است هر که بر ضد ما نیست با ما نیست یوحنا گفت استاد شخصی را دیدیم که به نام تو دیو اخراج می کرد 
اما چون از ما نبود او را باز داشتیم عیسی گفت بازش مدارید زیرا کسی نمیتواند به نام من معجزه کند و دمی بعد در حق من بد بگوید زیرا هر که بر ضد ما نیست با ما نیست آمین به شما میگویم هر که از آن سبب که به مسیح تعلق دارید حتی جامی آب به, به نام من به شما بدهد بیگمان بیفاداش نخواهد ما تعلیم در باب وسوسه و لغزش و هر که سبب شود یکی از این کوچکان که به من ایمان دارن لغزش خورد او را بهتر می بود که سنگ آسیابی بزرگ به گردنش بیاویزند و به دریا افکنند اگر دستت تو را می لغزاند آن را قطع کن زیرا تو را بهتر آن است که علیل به حیات راه یابی تا آنکه با دو دست به دوزخ روی با آتشی که هرگز خاموش نمی شود جایی که کرم آنها نمی میرد و آتش خاموش نمی پذیرد و اگر پایت تو را می لغزاند آن را قطع کن زیرا تو را بهتر آن است که لنگ به حیات راه یابی تا آنکه با دو پا به دوزخ افکنده شوی جایی که کرم آنها نمی میرد و آتش خاموشی نمی پذیرد و اگر چشمت تو را می لغزاند آن را به در آر زیرا تو را بهتر آن است که با یک چشم به پادشاهی خدا راه یابی تا آنکه با دو چشم به دوزخ افکنده شوی جایی که کرم آنها نمی میرد و آتش خاموشی نمی پذیرد زیرا همه با آتش نمکین خواهند شد نمک نیکوست اما اگر خاصیت را از دست بدهد چگونه می توان آن را نمکین ساخت شما نیز در خود نمک داشته باشید و با یکدیگر در صلح و صفا به سر برید آمین Thank you, Hamid. Well, we have a few moments of quiet now as our offerings for the Lord's work are received and as the musicians play. You might like to meditate on these words that we'll be studying shortly with Rupert, but as we do that in the quiet, our offerings are received.
Well, we're going to continue in prayer together as we sing the words of the Lord's Prayer in our version of that that's on your sheets. Our Father God, who dwells in heaven, draw near to hear your children. Well, friends, thank you for having me back. I'm glad to say that Edinburgh North haven't quite kicked me out yet, but it is a real joy to see so many friendly faces again. I wonder if you would turn back to Mark chapter 9 and verse 30, printed on the service sheets if you pick one up, and let's bow our heads and ask for our Father's help. Lord God, we pray this evening that you would help us to take you at your word. We pray for Josh, as no doubt his mind is full of many things. And we pray for each one of us with hearts and minds that often don't want to hear what your son has to say. By your spirit, Father, do your work in us tonight and help us to follow after Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, often our nicknames say a lot more about us than perhaps we'd like to admit. I was born short and yellow, with stumpy legs and a pot belly, and so my parents quickly took to calling me Poo, <laughs> which was fine, I guess, until I got to school, because you realize pretty quickly that the word Poo has a crucial silent H at the end of it, and that, word, that letter at the end isn't always obvious to your mates, is it, when the word is called across the schoolyard by your adoring, adoring parents. Parents can be very cruel, as if Rupert wasn't bad enough. 
It could be worse, though, I think. Um, Jose Mourinho, the, the Man United boss now, he surely has the most embarrassing nickname of them all, doesn't he? Because it says just a little bit too much about his self-regard. Please don't call me arrogant, he said at his first ever press conference in charge of a UK team. But I'm European champion, and I think I'm a special one. <laughs> and from that moment on, as far as the British press were concerned, his fate was sealed. Jose Mourinho would forever be known as the special one. Not a great nickname to hold if one day you'll have to look the Lord Jesus in the eye. But there is a bit of a special one complex, isn't there, in every one of us. The big message, I think, of our age is that every child is special. We're all special, and we all deserve to have our own special needs met. And our great goal in life is to become more special, to achieve some sort of greatness, rank or title or wealth or fame or power or influence. I think those are the messages we tell our kids from the earliest age and they stick in our hearts right through life. But a chapter or so back in this gospel, Jesus started the job of digging that message out of us. He's been showing us what kind of special one, what kind of Messiah he is. But it seems like his disciples cannot and will not take that message in. Their thinking is infected with what Jesus calls the things of man, thinking that puts glory here and now before everything else. And so now for a second time in this gospel, Jesus gives those disciples a massive, stark warning about his coming death and resurrection. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him. And when he's killed, only then, after three days, he'll rise again. That's what glory is going to look like for Jesus, the Messiah. And for a second time, he tells them, it has to be the cross first, and only then the crown, only then glory and resurrection. And once again, verse 32, his disciples do not understand a word of it. And this time we're given one more little detail by Mark. Now, they're afraid even to ask what it means. You see, Jesus' message, as his disciples have followed him in this book on the road towards the cross, it has not been a very comfortable message to listen to. Peter didn't like it one bit, and that provoked a furious response from Jesus. Because if the cross comes before the crown for Jesus, then it has to be the same for his disciples. Death before glory. Death to sin and self and status. And it seems now that they're scared to hear Jesus repeat that message. They don't want to hear him say it again. Maybe denial is just more comfortable. Perhaps the hardest lesson of all for us human disciples to learn is that I am simply not that special. At least not in the ways I tend to believe. If there's anything special about me from a biblical perspective, it's that by God's sheer grace... I'm being made back into his image, made more like his son, more like someone who's willing to lay all his specialness aside. So what we get through this whole central section of Mark's gospel is a sustained explanation of what it looks like to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow after Jesus. And it's aimed fairly and squarely at Jesus' disciples. Look at verse 31. He kept hidden because he was teaching his disciples. That's the program here. Verse 35, he sat down, time for some formal teaching, and he called the 12. And his basic message all the way through is what he tells them right there. If anyone would be first, he must be last and servant of all. It's the cross before the crown. But the reason he has to spell this out so painfully, so many times, is that it's a message that every fiber in our bodies is going to want to reject. Look what surrounds the whole passage. Look at the bookends. Jesus talks about his death, and verse 34, his disciples argue about who's the greatest. 
Who's the special one? And right to the end, verse 50, what's the summary? Worry about yourselves, have salt in yourselves, and be at peace with one another. In other words, cut the crud, stop arguing. None of you are that special. Get over yourselves. That's verses 30 to 50. We basically get three separate bits of teaching about our special one complex, those things of men, with the whole thing climaxing in this horrific warning about where that kind of human thinking leads. A warning that makes our language, when we talk about judgments and hell, seem pretty anemic and pathetic, doesn't it? Jesus isn't nearly so squeamish. He loves too much to varnish his message. So here's our main point then for this evening. Hell is full of special people. Hell is full of special people. People, in fact, just like these disciples. Because doesn't their reaction to Jesus' message seem so bonkers to us? Doesn't it seem crazy? Jesus has just told them about the cross being at the heart of everything. They're on the road towards it. And that's when they start squabbling about who will get what honor when they arrive in Jerusalem. Who will get a seat in the house of lords and who's going to get stuck with an OBE? It seems bonkers to us, doesn't it? To think that a bunch of fishermen could be so jumped up about their status and job title and position unless we know ourselves well enough. I can be capable of some very crass thinking, very ambitious thinking. I'm sure you can too. I can daydream about it even while I'm sitting through a sermon on the gospel. Can't you? Maybe we're not all that different. And notice Jesus sees right through them. They've been avoiding him along this road, muttering quietly to themselves, scared to front up to him and ask. But he knows, doesn't he, what's going on in their hearts, and it's not the cross. So he gives them these three little connected paragraphs, spelling out what it means to embrace his way rather than glory here and now. If we're going to follow Jesus, we shouldn't look for any kind of special status or special access to him or special passes when it comes to our own sin. Especially Josh, guys, those of us who want to call ourselves leaders in Jesus' church. First, verses 33 to 37, special status. And that desire is just so natural to us, isn't it? Think how today, even, clergy like to give ourselves funny titles and ranks and costumes and set ourselves apart. Some denominations do it the posh way. Our type just do it by the way we rank our staff on the church websites. But we all do it, don't we? We want a special status. I was dead chuffed to move to Edinburgh North Church and become their first pastor, the vicar, until I discovered they already had a nickname for our friend Pete Dixon. They call him the Bishop of Bingham. So now I've got to promote myself to Archbishop, or I'm going to be in Pete's shadow forever. I thought I'd escaped. I thought I'd got the status. But we all play that game, don't we? My kids at the moment, they love a cartoon that's set in a dog shelter. And the running joke in this cartoon is the miserable official who runs the place. Every episode, he comes up with some cunning plan to impress the mayor and get his dream promotion. He's longing to be made head of sanitation. Escape the dog shelter. That's the dream. Just one rung up on the ladder of life. Well, the apostles have cottoned on to the fact that Jesus' kingdom is coming, and so they head towards Jerusalem like a government in waiting, heads full of who's going to get what important position when they arrive. But if they'd been paying attention, they'd know it was martyrdom they were waiting for. That's where this highway through the wilderness is leading. And to Jesus, look at verse 35, that is the mark of true greatness become a servant. And that's why he brings this little child into the middle of the room, isn't it, and picks him up in his arms. Don't misunderstand it. Jesus doesn't say there's something special about kids. It's not sentimental. It's not that kids are innocent or trusting or anything like that. No, the point in Mark is quite the opposite. Kids were nobodies. 
In fact, assuming Jesus is speaking Aramaic, the word for child is probably the very same as the word for servant. It's a nobody. This is not a culture that idolizes children. You're more likely to give them a clip around the ears and send them off to feed the chickens, muck out the goats. It's not a child-centered culture. There's nothing to be gained by welcoming a little child, is there? That's the point. They can't offer you anything. So if what you care about is status and connection, well, a child is just a waste of your time. And yet receive an ordinary little child who belongs to Jesus, verse 37, and you receive the Father himself. Welcome the servant, and you welcome the king. Want the crown? Well, first take up your cross. Make an effort with those people you think are beneath you. So we don't need endless ranks and titles in the church, do we? One great thing about being here at the Tron is that you always get a good handshake on the door, and then usually another one on your way out from the minister or the preacher or the location pastor or whoever it is. And that's a great way for us to catch people at the end and chat to them about the sermon. It's pastorally a very helpful time. But I wonder, though, which handshake we notice more. Did we realize that the bloke who shook our hands on the way in this evening is just as much of a big shot in Jesus' kingdom as the one standing there on the way out? In fact, it was the Logie sisters, wasn't it? Maybe more of a big shot. We'll never know. Well, we'll know one day. We'll know in heaven, won't we? If you want to follow me, Jesus says, don't expect special status. And next, verses 38 to 41, don't go looking for special access. There's no inside circle, is there, when it comes to Jesus? Either you belong to him or you don't. But doing some special job in his church can't bring you any closer. And that's what John was looking for, isn't it? He seems ministry as something to be done by a private, privileged group who are on the inside with Jesus. So we see some itinerant bampots wandering around invoking Jesus' name, and it gets his hackles up. He isn't part of the club, is he? Who does he think he is? But again, Mark is piling on the irony, isn't he? Jesus has just talked about welcoming little ones in his name, and here's a man working in Jesus' name, verse 38, who John refuses to accept. You see the point? It wasn't really about children, was it? This is what little ones look like. People without recognition or important roles in the denomination or connections to the right people. And I guess the real sting is that just a page ago, we saw Jesus in a circle, his disciples trying to cast out a demon of their own and completely stuffing it up because they didn't pray. It was all about them, their ability. So here's a nice little dig in the ribs for them. This guy, whoever he is, at least he's trusting Jesus. And ultimately, that's what matters. Not, is he following us, verse 38, but is he following Jesus? There are plenty of Christians, I guess, in Scotland whose theology we probably look down on a little and whose philosophy of ministry isn't quite our own, And that's okay. It's why we've got our own little Didasco family, isn't it? We can wish them all well and get on with ministry the way we think best and let a thousand flowers bloom. But just because we aren't in the same club doesn't mean we get some kind of special priority in Jesus' kingdom. John had a very important role to play, didn't he? Maybe, well, definitely more important than any of us. But the job I'm given doesn't bring me any closer to Jesus. It's worth just pausing and asking yourself, are you serving hard in your name or in his name? Is it all for the sake of your own greatness or is it simply for the joy of serving him? My special role in church doesn't get me any closer to him, which is why just as we don't need archbishops and popes. Jesus doesn't have any use for priests, does he? My job as a pastor isn't to worm my way into Jesus in a circle so that people can get close to me and get in on the action. I can't dish out the holiness, and you don't need Josh to do that either, do you? Remember that little child. Welcome him, 
you welcome Jesus. That's how this family works. But John was so busy polishing his imaginary crown that when a little one came knocking, he turned his nose up. And without knowing it, he turned up his nose at the king himself, missed out on his chance to receive him. Denying ourselves means giving up the hope of special access to Jesus himself. There's no such thing as there as a super Christian, which means you and I need to watch out if we tend to guard our role in church with a kind of protective jealousy. There's something about religious activity, isn't there, which brings that sort of behavior out of us. Only I really know how to do this job properly. It's not as simple as they all seem to think. Only I can have this role. That feeling that I've made myself particularly useful in Christ's church, that I've got some sort of special in with Jesus, most of us find that feeling hard to resist. But none of us are indispensable, are we? We're just not that special. And so thirdly, verses 42 to 50, we get the warning. Taking up our cross and denying ourselves means not expecting any special passes when it comes to our sin. None of us are such big shots in Jesus' kingdom that he's going to turn a blind eye to our behavior, not even the twelve. Now, if Jesus' language here doesn't shock you, then, friend, you might just need a lobotomy because it is meant to be a gruesome picture, isn't it? Three times he talks about hell. Three times he mentions a fire that never stops smoldering. It's a picture of a festering rubbish dump. The word he uses is Gehenna, the name of the tip outside Jerusalem. And he's picturing it littered with corpses, living corpses riddled with worms, shut out forever from life from the kingdom. Jesus is more plain and serious and direct when he talks about hell than anyone else in the Bible, isn't he? Gentle, loving Jesus. And that quote he uses there in verse 48, those are literally the very last words of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 24, massively significant in Mark's big picture. You see, Isaiah tells a story that Mark is constantly tapping into, the story of a new exodus. God's people are lost in the wilderness because of their sin, but at last, he has stepped into their world and ransomed his people and led them home. And Isaiah's story ends there in chapter 66 in a brand new heaven and a brand new earth. But at the same time, there's this picture of terrible judgment for those who rebel against him, a worm that never dies, a fire that's never quenched. Well, back to Mark. And who does Jesus say that fire is reserved for? Not, I think, the people we might expect. It's not for sinners in general. No, the ones who miss out on that new exodus, the new heavens and the new earth are the ones who refuse to walk Jesus' way of the cross. All through this section of Mark's gospel, Jesus has been leading his people along that highway out of the wilderness, the only road back home to God, a road of repentance, a road where we share in Jesus' cross. But that's what his disciples have struggled to accept. You see, it's not Sin in general, he's talking about here, is it? Look carefully at verse 42. It's those who cause these little ones who believe in him to sin. Those who are so puffed up with their own pride and glory that they end up damaging Jesus' ordinary disciples because they won't take up their cross and I think they lead others astray. He's got a very specific set of sins in mind here, I think. Bickering, and boasting, and big egos. You sometimes hear wise old pastors say there are three sins which tend to ruin a Christian ministry. Almost always, when a high-flying preacher comes crashing down, it boils down to gold, girls, or glory. The desire to grasp at those things and abuse our position to get them, that is just too tempting to overcome. Gold, girls, and glory. 
temptations we all face, but they only get worse with position and power. And those sorts of sins damage little ones who believe in Jesus more than any other. So by all means, yes, we should take this as a warning to deal radically with any sin in our lives. But above all, we need to remember that those little ones, those ordinary, plain Jane Christians are very, very precious to Jesus Christ. And if we treat them with indifference or set them a bad example through our own self-importance, well, one day, verse 42, we'll wish we could vanish without trace to the bottom of the ocean. So if my eye is constantly envying someone else's position, I'd be better off gouging that eye out than giving in to what it wants. I don't believe that, do I? But Jesus tells me it's true. If my hand is always trying to grasp for more money and less sacrifice, more prestige and less service, I'd be better off hacking that hand away. If my foot is always restless for the job or the house, or the position that's going to win friends and influence people, I would be better off on crutches because it's the cross first and only then the crown. That's the way Jesus is leading us. And verse 49, every one of us is going to be seasoned by bearing that cross from the greatest to the least, even you disciples, even you 12. That's what he's saying, isn't it? No special passes. And that struggle, that denial of ourselves, that is a good, pleasing struggle to God. So worry about that, verse 50. Worrying about having salt in yourselves. Because if you're so busy squabbling with each other about position and status, then how on earth are you going to point others to my kingdom? Hell is full of special people, isn't it? Churchgoers who convince ourselves that we've got some sort of special status or special spiritual access, or a special pass for our sin. And that is a hard message for us to hear. It is, at least for me. Because that special thinking worms its way into my heart all the time. I really do believe there's something special about me. But if that's a hard lesson to learn, well, take heart. Because there is also some very encouraging news. I want us to notice before we close. No, no, I'm not a big shot in Jesus' kingdom. But the wonderful thing here is that it is quite enough to be one of Jesus' little ones. That is all he asks of me, isn't it? Hell might be full of special people, but heaven is for little ones. And we don't need to labor the point because hopefully you've seen it by now, but just notice how many ways in this passage Jesus is reassuring us that ordinary is okay. Let's start with the most difficult bit, shall we? Those verses that speak so shockingly about how we deal with sin. Because even there, it's not a call to some sort of spiritual heroics, is it? He's not saying that if only you fight hard enough, if only you punish yourself enough and conquer your pride and beat your sin, you can win your way into heaven. Because he's already told us how deep our sin problem goes. Back in chapter 7, he said that the real problem wasn't my eye or my hand or my leg. The real problem's inside me. That's where the sewer is. I can't amputate my heart, but that's what I'd need to do to conquer this sort of sin. So this isn't a call to heroics. It's not about perfectionism. It's the little ones who need his grace and who know it and who take their sins seriously. It's them who win the crown. And he's reassuring them about that crown right through the passage, isn't he? Verse 37. Receive an insignificant little child and you welcome the king. Sure, he won't be handing out medals and gongs to the super-Christians. But in Jesus' kingdom, even the most insignificant little child is connected to royalty. And verse 41 takes it further, doesn't it? Even the tiniest thing you do 
in Jesus' name is a precious thing in his eyes. And it's something that will never, ever be forgotten. That littlest act of kindness to his people, just a cup of cold water. And God's response is ridiculously over the top. A crown you can never, ever lose. Josh, there is great reward in following Jesus into a life of service. There's reward now in seeing others flourish. And there's reward at the end when you claim back the big salary you've passed up and the tears you shed and all the sleep you lost. And brother, let me just say this. You have had the very best of starts in ministry, surrounded by fantastic people who love the gospel and who are all very able in different ways. But sometimes along with that, you can start to worry that the goal is to become something you're not quite able to be. You worry that every sermon has to be special because you're surrounded by very impressive people. You can worry that your capacity to handle things ought to be the same as the people you're learning from. But that isn't what God expects from you, brother. The goal isn't to become special or even to match up. The goal is just to use whatever Christ has given you for his service. And to do that with thankfulness and to point all the praise back to him. There's great reward in becoming one of his little ones. And that is all he asks of any of us, isn't it? Yes, the cross comes first. And that cuts against our nature to deny ourselves and become ordinary and accept our limitations. To some people, that might look like an utter waste of a life. But the cross isn't really ordinary at all, is it? The cross is powerful. It's the way Jesus himself took on the world and the flesh and the devil. And it is privilege enough to follow him along that road. It's all he asks of us, to give up on our pride and become one of his little ones. And one day we'll understand that there is nothing greater that any of us could ever be. Well, let's pray. If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. Father God, help us to believe there is something very special in being an ordinary follower of Jesus Christ. That to become like him truly is the greatest calling, the greatest privilege we could ever ask for. We shudder, Lord, at the warnings in this passage. And yet we rejoice at the same time, knowing the depths to which Jesus went to save us from that hell. And so we pray, Father, that his cross would run so deep in our little family of churches that it controls everything we think and feel and do, both as we hold it out with joy as the solution to our sinfulness, and also as we follow him along this road of service and self-giving, not for the sake of our pride and position, but for the love of him who stoops to serve us. Help us, Father, to follow him. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. May the mind of Christ my Savior live in me from day to day by his love and power controlling all I do and say. What a great prayer to sing now in response to his words. Let's stand together.
Please be seated. Brothers and sisters, we are a church in the Presbyterian tradition. And that means that although we believe that the focus of ordinary church life is uh, within the local congregation, nevertheless, each congregation, uh, at least each truly gospel congregation, is not independent, but is rather interdependent, along with other gospel churches, and mutually accountable to the rule of Christ himself. That's the pattern that uh, we believe we see in the New Testament, when in cities like Jerusalem or Ephesus or Corinth, uh, the church clearly consisted of many separate house churches, but their leaders could all be gathered together in one place and addressed as the oversight of the church in that place, that is, united in their interdependence under the apostolic teaching. And this interdependence and mutual accountability was especially important in the issue of recognizing and accepting genuine teaching ministry, because, of course, that had to be consistent and true and trusted uh, through all the churches. So in Acts chapter 6, for example, when uh, Paul chose Timothy as his co-worker, we're told that Timothy had the approval and the support of the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. That was a plurality of churches and leaders. In 1 Timothy 4, Paul tells us that it was a, a body of presbyters, no doubt the leaders of these various churches who laid hands on Timothy alongside Paul to ordain him, that is to publicly recognize him and to enable him for his ministry uh, throughout those many churches. And this is all bound up with a matter of authority and accountability. To be ordained like that by a group of leaders is to be accountable to them because these men are responsible for conferring that pastoral office and that task upon you. That's why Paul later is able to write, to exhort Timothy in the pastoral epistles and uh, to encourage him in his calling and to appeal to his ordination as he does so because uh, that ordination created that relationship of accountability. And of course, closely tied to that accountability is also authority. Do you remember the centurion remarked to Jesus that it's those recognized to be under authority who can carry authority and who can exercise authority among others. So Timothy is told that he's to teach the truth, rebuking, reproving, exhorting. And that's whether what he says proves to be popular or not among those who hear it. Now, he can only do that because his authority is recognized to come from beyond merely the congregation that he is ministering in at the time, where it may well be that many people don't want to hear what he says and don't like it. And if his authority was conferred only from within that congregation, if, uh, as we could say, if the pulpit controlled, uh, if the pew uh, controlled the pulpit, then if what he teaches is unpopular or is unwanted, then they can simply remove his authority and indeed remove him. And sadly, that is often the story in situations where church government is entirely congregational uh, with no recognition of this essential interdependence of ministry among those who claim the the apostolic heritage, the gospel heritage in succession. Now, churches must know, mustn't they, that their teachers have authority, and therefore that we must be bound to heed that teaching, to submit to that teaching. But part of the trust involved in that is that churches must also know that these teachers are held accountable, accountable to a body of trusted others, who will keep them as they keep one another accountable to biblical truth, accountable to the apostolic faith. And they need to know, of course, that if their teacher is in error, either in life or doctrine or both, that others will hold him to account. And at the same time, they need to know also that as he walks in godliness and in truth, 
And in his ministry, he will have the support and indeed the force of others behind him because he may well have to confront error in the church among them, both for the good of that congregation and church life and also, of course, for the common good of all truly gospel-believing churches because where one church goes awry, it affects all of us. So this is, in essence, the value that such extra-congregational accountability has within the church. And effective accountability comes not from mere uh, structural unity, but unity in the truth of the apostolic gospel, unity in the shared convictions about and commitment to the living ministry of that truth today. So in recent years, we in this congregation have become very closely bound together with a number of churches uh, who have shared our recent journey as well as sharing a very important heritage and ethos in living Bible teaching ministry in Scotland. And we're now united in a small presbytery called the Didasco Fellowship. Didasco is just a Bible word that means teaching because we want to emphasize that we stand upon the teaching of Scripture. And this fellowship has already proved vital in bringing support and stability and indeed strength to our congregations in a time of challenge, a time of transition, and we believe it will continue to foster strength and growth and development, we trust, in the future. So that's why this ordination tonight is not just a congregational matter, it's not just uh, of our church here at the Tron, it's a presbyterial matter. We have here this evening a body of uh, pastor teachers, a body of presbyters who know us and who are at one with us in the gospel, and together we will act to publicly ordain our brother Josh to the ministry of Christ Church because this is a ministry that we all have an interest in and we're all responsible for. And we're glad also to welcome uh, among us this evening, alongside our own uh, pastors, uh, some others from uh, local churches with whom we share great bonds of fellowship in Christ. And because, you see, these bonds in Christ among us are real, then we can have an accountability among us that is both real and realistic. And that's how effective ministries are kept together and kept to the gospel of Christ. So I'm going to invite the pastors here to come forward this evening and to stand with Josh uh, as he stands before us to take these vows before us all. And Josh, would you come and stand? And I know it's very difficult for you because you've got a very sore back. And so we'll forgive you if you're not standing straight, but a little crooked. Josh stands before us all here this evening as someone who's known not only in our own congregation, but among all these other Christian leaders here today. He is known as someone who has proved himself as a workman of God who rightly handles the word of truth. He was first an apprentice with us here at the Tron for two years as he completed the Cornhill training course. And then for a further three years, he's been uh, working with us and being trained with us for ordained ministry uh, in Christ's church. He's been examined uh, by our presbytery, which has agreed wholeheartedly to ordain him into the position of assistant minister here at the Tron. And of course, we know that his particular responsibility is to lead the ministry team uh, for our Farsi-speaking congregation, uh, among other things. And so... In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the sole king and the sole head of the church, who being ascended on high and having given gifts for the edifying of the body of Christ, we're met this evening as a presbytery, as a, a body of pastor teachers, to ordain Josh Johnston to the holy ministry by prayer and by the laying on of hands, and to confirm him in his appointment as assistant minister in this congregation, the Tron Church. And in this act, the church, as part of the Holy Catholic or Universal Church, worshiping one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, this church affirms anew its belief in the gospel of the sovereign grace and love of God, wherein through Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, incarnate, crucified, and risen, he freely offers to all people upon repentance and faith the forgiveness of sins, renewal by the Holy Spirit, and eternal life 
and calls them to labor in the fellowship of faith for the advancement of the kingdom of God throughout the world. <clears throat> the Tron Church and the Didasco Fellowship acknowledge the word of God written in the scriptures of the Old and New Testament to be the supreme rule of faith and life and avows the fundamental doctrines of the Catholic faith founded thereupon. It holds also as its subordinate standard the Westminster Confession of Faith containing the sum and substance of the Reformed faith, recognizing liberty of opinion on such points of doctrine as do not enter the substance of the faith and for the avoidance of doubt, the substance of our faith does include everything contained in the Didasco Fellowship Covenant and in the Statement of Belief of the West of Scotland Gospel Partnership. And therefore, Josh, I need to put these uh, questions that are before us all in the sheets uh, to you this evening and for you to answer before us all uh, these things. And as I do so, I'm going to ask the congregation to stand with Josh as he takes these vows before God and before us all. Josh, do you believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? And do you confess in you the Lord Jesus as your Savior and Lord? Do you believe the Word of God, that is, the Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, to be the supreme rule of faith and life? And are you persuaded that the Holy Scriptures contain all doctrine required as necessary for eternal salvation through faith in Jesus Christ? And are you determined out of the said Scriptures to instruct the people committed to your charge and to teach nothing as necessary to eternal salvation but that which you shall be persuaded may be concluded and proved by the Scripture? Will you be ready with all faithful diligence to banish and drive away from the church all erroneous and strange doctrines contrary to God's word and to use both public and private munitions and exhortations to the sick as to the whole as need shall require and occasion shall be given? I will, Lord God. will you be diligent in prayer and in reading the Holy Scriptures and in such studies as help to the knowledge of the same, laying aside the study of the world and the flesh. I will endeavor to do these and more than these things. Will you be diligent to frame and fashion your own self and your family according to the doctrine of Christ, and to make both yourself and them, as much as in you lies, wholesome examples and patterns of the flock of Christ? I will apply myself thereto, the Lord being my help. Do you believe the fundamental doctrines of the Christian faith contained in the confession of faith of this church? And do you acknowledge the government of this church to be agreeable to the word of God? I do. do you promise to be subject in the Lord to those to whom is committed the charge and government over you, following with glad mind and will their godly admonitions and submitting yourself to their godly judgments? I will do so, the Lord being my help. Do you promise to seek the peace and the unity of this church, to uphold its doctrine, worship, government, and to cherish a spirit of love to all your brothers and sisters in Christ. I do. Are not zeal for the glory of God, and love to the Lord Jesus Christ, and a desire for the salvation of men, so far as you know your own heart, your great motives and chief inducements to enter the office of the Holy Ministry? Do you engage in the strength of the Lord Jesus Christ to live a godly and circumspect life and faithfully, diligently, and cheerfully, that's the hard one, discharge the duties of your ministry, seeking in all things the advancement of the kingdom of God? Almighty God, who has given you this will to do all these things, grant also unto you strength and power to perform the same that he may accomplish his work which he has begun in you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Josh, you're now required to sign the appointed formula as a seal of the vows uh, that you're made. And as uh, Josh does that, I'll read to you the words of the formula. It says, I believe the fundamental doctrines of the Christian faith contained in the Didasco Fellowship Covenant and the Statement of Belief of the West of Scotland Gospel Partnership. 
I declare that I believe the scriptures of the Old and New Testament to be the supreme rule of faith and life, and I accept the system of doctrine of Westminster Confession of Faith as the, board, as the subordinate standard of this church, and will uphold these teachings and proclaim them to the church and the world. I acknowledge the government of this church to be agreeable to the word of God, and I promise to observe the order of worship and the administration of all public ordinances as the same are or may be allowed in this church. Josh, would you kneel as you're able? And gather around. Let's pray. God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, you call us in your mercy. You sustain us by your power. Through every generation, your wisdom supplies our need. You sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, to be the apostle and high priest of our faith and the shepherd of our souls. By his death and resurrection, he has overcome death and having ascended into heaven, has poured out his spirit, making some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, teachers, to equip all for the work of ministry and to build up his body, the church. We pray you now pour out your Holy Spirit upon this your servant, whom we now in your name and in obedience to your will by the laying on of hands ordain and appoint to the office of a holy ministry within the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, committing to him authority to minister your word and sacraments and to share in the government of your church. Give him joy in serving you. Give him patience in affliction. And keep him faithful in prayer that he may be kept strong in your service until with all your servants you bring him to share in your eternal joy. Through Christ who died for us, rose again and lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And I, Josh, I declare you to be ordained into the office of the Holy Ministry. And in token of this, we all here greet you with the right hand of fellowship and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. present you with this book. This is the most valuable thing this world affords. Here is wisdom. Here is the royal law. These are the lively oracles of God. Take it, make it yours in your own heart and use it all the days of your ministry to bless the hearts of others. God bless you, Josh. And now as we take our seats, Peter Adam is going to come and give a charge to Josh and to all of us, and then Peter Dixon will come and pray. Josh, this ministry charge is based on Paul's instructions to Timothy in the New Testament. And every word of it applies as directly to you as it did to that servant of God 2,000 years ago. Fan into flame the gift of God that is within you through the laying on of hands. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power and love and self-discipline. Do not be ashamed then of the testimony about our Lord, but join in suffering for the gospel, relying on the power of God. Hold to the standard of sound teaching that you've read in the scriptures, 
in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Guard the good treasure of the gospel entrusted to you with the help of the Holy Spirit. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you've heard through many witnesses and trust to faithful people, you'll be able to teach others as well. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, a descendant of David. Endure everything for the sake of the elect, so that they may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved by him, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly explaining the word of truth. All who cleanse themselves from evil will become special utensils, dedicated and useful to the owner of the house, ready for every good work. So shun evil passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with all who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you learnt it, and how you've known the sacred writings that have the power to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. For all scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I solemnly urge you, proclaim the message. Be persistent whether the time is favorable or unfavorable. Convince, rebuke, and encourage with the utmost patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not put up with sound doctrine, but having itching ears, they'll accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own desires and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander away to myths. But as for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, Carry out your ministry fully. Fight the good fight. Finish the race. Keep the faith. From now on, there is reserved for you the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give you on that day and to all who have longed for his appearing. May our gracious God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit sustain you in your faith in Christ, in holiness of life, in godliness, and in good ministry. May God be in your head and in your understanding. May God be in your eyes and in your looking. May God be in your mouth and in your speaking. May God be in your heart and in your thinking. May God be at your end and at your departing. In Christ's name, amen. Now let's pray together. O oh God, our Heavenly Father, majestic in glory and by heaven adored, we worship you together with gratitude, with praise, with love. And we ask that you would preserve Josh and all of us who serve you as your children. Preserve him and us, Heavenly Father, from regarding himself as special our crucified Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, your glories we love to sing. And so we pray, enable Josh and Kate and all in their circle of family and friends 
to point one another constantly to you, Lord Jesus, when that path of selfless love they take, with all its ordinary ups and downs, feels too long or too costly to bear. We thank you afresh, Heavenly Father, for the good news of the gospel this evening, which we love to proclaim and to sing and to know, news which we love to teach and to read, to know in our hearts and to share with others. And whilst we pray that you will give Josh a lifelong hunger to grasp more and more of the depth and the grace of that gospel. Dear Heavenly Father, may he never cease to love to explain it to the youngest child or simplest soul. Our Father, you do dwell in heaven, and yet how readily you hear our prayer when we ask you to draw near to us to hear us as we speak. May Josh, Lord, and all whom he serves in your name know the constant and humbling encouragement of the prayers of many brothers and sisters in Christ, those in the Tron here in their church family, and friends throughout this growing family of churches which we delight in. Dear Heavenly Father, as together we pray, and as we pray for your kingdom to come, so may Josh and Kate be able to give you thanks day by day as you answer our prayers. May your beauty rest upon us, dear Lord, as we seek the lost to win, even in this week to come. Protect us all we ask from ever thinking we are serving you well or appropriately if the longing of our hearts is not for the lost. And so we pray too that you would give Josh and give each of us in your mercy the love of the Lord Jesus for those who do not love the Lord Jesus. Dear Heavenly Father, take him, take us. In this week to come, help us to know you, to trust you, to proclaim and serve you, to enjoy you and walk with you. And all we ask is for your great name's sake. Amen. Now our final hymn of praise for all the saints who from their labors rest, who thee by faith before the world confess.
and a final prayer. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together we may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And to that end, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and always. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being with us here this evening, those of you who are visiting. Please do stay and enjoy uh, fellowship together. As I said, there'll be refreshments downstairs. And uh, do greet Josh if he's uh, able to receive your greeting. He may be lying on the sofa over in the corner, but nonetheless, he'll still be here. Thank you. <laughs>